Thank you very much. Um, you just heard Brian. He's, uh, he, he was very decent in the end, but uh, he's a very particular and very interesting person and he held very high ranking jobs. And also 28 years ago, we were sitting on a very, very s small table together uh, working at the Office of Chief Medical Examiner in New York City. And we were sitting really next to each other as narrow as persons could sit next to each other for quite a while, uh, like, like from 1997 to 1999. Um, the, and I'm also a Sherlockian. Um, the, so, yeah. um, yes, of course. It's better? Okay. Um, I stumbled into, um, into the, this investigation. Oh, first I have to disclose uh, no commercial interest, no nothing. Um, so that's the slide. Um, during the meeting of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences in New Orleans quite a while ago, 2005, when there was somebody on stage, I think, at uh, Bring Your Own Slides, and he said, I have a piece of soap, and I would like to know if this piece of soap comes from, uh, was boiled out of human fat at a concentration camp. And we were all sitting there, and we were like, ah, that's going to be difficult chemically, and so on and so on. So, but I kept that in the back of my head. Now, a few days ago, um, we had 80 years of uh, the, that concentration camp. Uh, Auschwitz was freed. This is one of the largest newspapers in Germany, just on January 25. And you can see that people are still talking about it. There are still 12,000 pots um, there, um, 6,000 toothbrushes, 3,800 suitcases, and so on and so on. So there's a lot of evidence there, but that's an exception. Some of the concentration campsites don't exist at all anymore. There's absolutely zilch, nothing left. And um, another one of those sites is located in Weimar. Weimar is one of the cities in Germany where f very famous poets uh, come from. It's a beautiful, picturesque town, as you can see. This is just a few months ago I took those pictures. And it really looks like you would expect uh, like a, you know, a stereotypical German town probably to look like. But when you come from the train station, you see the black and white pictures, and the black and white picker, pictures um, show people who survived concentration camp Buchenwald. This is a different concentration camp, and that is in uh, Weimar, or it has been in Weimar. Uh, there's not much left of it, because when the Russians came, they took down the interior part and made it like a military structure, but some of it remained, and the Russians decided that they would keep some of the evidence to show how gruesome the Nazis were. And in, uh, oh, th this is one of the worst uh, things I've ever seen. This is the gate, the original gate, and it says in German, some people speak German here in the room, it says, jedem das seine, which means everybody had to walk through that gate and uh, ending up in the concentration camp, and it needs to each his or her own. This is every time I, I walk through that gate, I really get like total bad type of goosebumps, really. That's the original gate, and when you go in, you see nothing. Because, like I said, the Russians took away most of it. That's my shadow there, but that's, uh, that's uh, by, by chance. You see the little rocks, of course, remembering people, mostly um, Jewish people, but there are also, uh, obviously, there were many other people killed, like religious people, priests, um, gay people, and people from all over the world. You, probably you cannot see it, but this is a list of all the countries out of which people came that were um, there in the concentration camp, either killed or uh, detained. And also they have a, a special stone there, a little memorial for homosexual men. One, um, what the Germans did after the war was they said, we, you know, it wasn't us. We, we were all um, anti-fascist and anti you know, we didn't like the Nazis. Um, it, was, it was all p p certain persons. For example, Goebbels, uh, the head of the propaganda, uh, or Adolf Hitler, of course. And um, the one of which you probably did not hear, but most Germans know her, it's, it's Ilse Koch. She was the wife of the head in command, at least for a while, at Buchenwald concentration camp. So she was the evil person, the super evil person, and everybody else was fine. A few years ago, um, a photographic album was found, and you can see that most of the people in SS um, there, uh, the, the, you know, the Nazi troops that were responsible for maintaining the camp, uh, were just living their best life there, and they even had affairs sometimes with uh, people from the concentration camp even, and um, it, that was really a shocking find. This is an original page, a direct photo from the original page, and it says the first snow, and you see the, um, the SS people, they're just, you know, living their normal life. Um, she was accused and um, all the blame went on to her. Of course, that is complete nonsense. 
and everybody knew that, but the Russians thought, okay, let's, let's play a little bit with that because Germans want to, don't want to feel guilty, so let's say some Nazis did all that and we will show some of the uh, remains that were left in the concentration camp. So they set up an exhibit, and in the exhibit you can see, that's a photo from back then, you can see a shrunken head, you can see a heart, the, these are tattoos, that's a different story. Like Brian said, that's a, that's a totally different rabbit hole. And you see a lampshade. That is a very famous lampshade in the literature. And here you can see another picture of the shrunken head allegedly made out of inmates' um, skin and also the lampshade. And most people didn't really believe it, but there was photographic, photographic evidence and also some witnesses' statements of surviving people who said, well, in the, in the chief's office, we did see um, a lampshade, and that was made out of human skin, but not of tattooed human skin, just of regular human skin. And we did that uh, on a regular basis, and these, the, it was a pr the production of gifts. So one of these pieces disappeared. That's the piece that you see here, and it later in my talk will come back. Uh, which was a good thing, because when the British were there, the British were given some evidence to take to England so they could uh, show the British people uh, that indeed in concentration camps, um, the Nazis, only in Buchenwald concentration camp, that was the only concentration camp where they did it, um, made uh, gift articles out of human skin. So I thought, you know, let, let's check with uh, the most modern methods that we had have because it, that was a huge political deal. There was a lot of propaganda going on over tens of years. And I went to the archive and inside of the archive we found, uh, you know, some um, medical stuff that I don't want to get into, but we found the shrunken head. The shrunken head looks very, very different to the shrunken head that you just saw. So I was like, wait a second, that doesn't even look like a real shrunken head because once in a while we, we do get to see shrunken heads and then they look like this, for example, or like the shrunken head that you have seen before, but not like the one that you saw in the last picture. That's an example um, that I just took out of um, uh, Western University. And this is the shrunken head that was found in concentration camp Buchenwald in, in the archive. This head was given or donated to the collection in 1985. And I mean, World War II ended in 1945. So um, we were already like, eh, I don't know, criminalistically speaking. And then my wife was there and in her first life before she became the super nerd that she is now, she was a certified cosmetologist. And she, she looks at that and she's like, that's, the, you know, that doesn't look like a, like a real ear opening and so on. And it doesn't look like a human hair. I would not have seen it, but uh, she saw it straight away. And I was like, let's, let's test it. So we took um, parts of the skin, which was a huge deal because these are the absolutely last remains existing from concentration camp Buchenwald. So we were not only sweating, you know, sweat, but also blood, really. I took uh, some of it. We discussed very much about where we should take it, what we should take, and I decided to um, take parts of it that contained hair. So. This is, uh, this is the front side, this is another side of the sample with a crime scene scale here in a metric scale. Um, and uh, then we sent it out to one of the people who had been working in the FBI lab, formerly the FBI lab, the hair lab that is closed now because they had to close it due to um, scientific uh, proceeding problems that were going on there. And the colleague there in the, from the former FBI lab said, well, we cannot exclude from what this looks like microscopically, um, we cannot exclude horse. It could be from a horse. And I'm like, yeah, exclusion is good when you think a Sherlockian, but I would like to do some DNA. And it took us a while. Uh, it was uh, really different. We had to do a blast DNA sequencing. I'm not going into that. And we found 99.7% um, uh, similarity to a goat. So this is made out of goat skin and goat hair. And we were like, oh, good God, that's quite a relief. Now, please let everything else be goat skin and whatever it is. So we checked the first lampshade. That was the small one that you have seen before. And we were warned because there was a lampshade that was found in New Orleans. This is the book that uh, the guy who found the uh, lampshade in New Orleans. And um, it's, uh, there's even a movie um, out or a little TV documentation from 2012. And the guy really was super convinced that this is one of the lampshades from Buchenwald. But it came out, it was made out of calf skin. So we were warned. And I was like, OK, let's approach this very, very, very thoroughly. So this is, and you can see that the, that the old uh, lampshade looks differently, it's much smaller. 
So an old um, expert witness statement from the 90s, to, uh, they used an Uchtaloni test, and in the Uchtaloni, that's only for forensic biologists in the room, and the Uchtaloni test uh, uh, told them in the year 1992 that this is not human skin. But when you look at it more closely, you see that they didn't have any information. It was just like, you know, no information, no information, no information. So I was like, that's not good enough. May I take a piece of skin out of that too? And then everybody's like, oh, we don't know, Mark, you know. But since I did the um, skull and uh, teeth identification of Adolf Hitler's skull, they were like, okay, you know, in that particular case, let, let Mark do it. So, um, we, yeah, because they trusted me. Really, I, so then, you know, I, I sterilized everything as good as I could in that archive, took out a piece of the lampshade or two pieces of the lampshade, and one thing that I found interesting was that if this would have been tan skin, it would look different because this doesn't look like tan skin. You know, you see like something like hair in there. And then I sent it to one of the laboratories, uh, one of the few laboratories that have uh, human skin to compare it to in a database microscopically. Don't ask me where they got it, but they have a tanned and non-tanned human skin there. And they told me straight away, this is human, 100%. It's a certified, accredited, validated lab. They do it for industrial purposes, and they're dealing with uh, skin that's worth millions and millions and millions of dollars. So they cannot make mistakes. But I was like, eh, I don't know. So we submitted it to DNA, you know. <laughs> And um, that, uh, it was very difficult to get DNA out of it. It was super old. We were, we were afraid that it was probably contaminated. And then, um, just for the forensic biologists amongst you, we used some primers that were published, so we, we really stick to um, established protocols. This was not done by me. The lab did not know what it had at that point. I decided that none of the labs uh, should know which type of stain they had. I just told them it's, a, it's an interesting stain and I need to work on it. And bam, DNA came out with blast sequencing, so that's a human lampshade. So we were all like, no, please, really. Um, you saw the heart. Um, the heart was also a very difficult one because it was thought that the heart of an actual inmate who was shot fell down in a jar. It was already in a jar, fell down, and was substituted by the Russians by a pig heart. And then they just put, you know, took a stake or something and stabbed the heart so that it looks as if it was the original human heart. I sent it to every forensic pathologist I knew, um, uh, the, first the pictures and then some samples, uh, then also the best DNA labs, only forensic DNA labs, only certified, uh, you know, accredited labs and so on. And they were all like, we don't get any DNA out of that. That, if you're a forensic biologist, you may have an idea how that is possible uh, because I took uh, a sample of uh, muscle. This is not the sample side, this is the shooting side. Um, but the head of the archive, he was really, really tense. So, he, so I offered him to open the jar, um, take a sample, replace the liquid, because the liquid was already stained and he didn't like that. And then, you, you can see what it looks like here. And then um, we took uh, the, the sample, like I said, no DNA, no nothing. But then in the end, I had an idea. Because even though DNA did not work in that case, we had the old photograph. And like Brian, I'm, a, you know, I'm as much a forensic biologist as a criminalist. So I thought, let's, ha let's make an enlargement of the picture. And in the enlargement, you can clearly see that this is the shooting of the heart that I looked at, uh, shooting wound. This is an anatomical feature of the heart, so that this is the original heart, because it looks exactly down to the millimeter like the actual heart. So in my um, witness statement, I said, okay, we don't have DNA, but um, from a criminalistic standpoint, if you can treat this like a fingerprint from the palm of your finger, not the genetic fingerprint, and you can just use anatomical features, and the anatomical features tell us that this is the actual heart from back then. And we thought it was over at that point, but that, that was just a few years ago. You know, I'm talking about very, very recent results here. But then, the British heard about that, and then one of the British politicians from the time, or a British institution, a museum, sent us a pocket knife pouch of which nobody had heard of that was given to them in 1945 to prove the, that what the Nazis did. So the pocket knife pouch came back and we were like, oh, please let that not be human skin because I don't know, you know, this is even more mind blowing than the lampshade because the, the, the lampshade story was out already for tens of years. So uh, we took the relatively or quite beautifully made um, um, pocket knife pouch 
gave it to the laboratory and they said, okay, that is interesting because this is done in an in a even better way because this is not only tanned, the skin was separated and there's another layer in between. Can we do DNA uh, on that? Because we will obviously use up and destroy parts of the sample. So, so this is glue here. Uh, in, in, in between and these are the layers of human skin and again we use established protocols so nothing you know that that c could be mistaken for uh, for a laboratory reason and again uh, uh, this uh, pocket knife pouch sadly is made out of human skin then we th by because this story spread then in the past month, we got the missing part of the original lamp from the chief's office from Buchenwald, where the original photo exists from the time when the concentration camp was freed from England. It was given uh, to the Germans, um, so to us. So again, we decided to do it, and you probably, this is a glove. This, don't worry, I'm, I'm probably the first one I'm probably the first one to ever wear a glove, but I did wear a glove here. And um, again, we decided to take a sample. You, probably you can already see this does not look tanned again. So we are talking about like, so to speak, raw human skin. I, I've never seen that before. I, I really had to get into, like Brian said, a rabbit hole here. And if you really flatten fresh human skin without tanning, you get, um, you get this display here that you see. And again, microscopically and DNA tested in um, different parts of the lab by different investigators. Um, this is uh, human skin. And then, and you know, then I thought, okay, this is really the end now. Please let it be the end. And I will be at the end of my speech now uh, very uh, soon. But then a few weeks ago, we got a cardboard box, a journalist who heard about the press conference that I gave, uh, or that we all gave at the concentration camp memorial site. And she was like, you know, I don't want to tell you too much, but um, I found in a cardboard box um, a lampshade that was in use until recently. And I really pressed on her and she was like, I, I really don't want to tell you like too exactly what happened, but I'm like, okay, you have to give us a location, you have to give us a time, you have to give us names. So at least she did that. And it, that stood in the laboratory until a few weeks ago because I was like, no, it doesn't look like human skin um, or no, I, no I, don't, I would like, you know, I retract that. It didn't look like the shape of the lampshades that we knew of, but then when you look at it, it looks really, really old and also not like the New Orleans lampshade that was made out of calf skin. So we, we thought like, no, 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 no. But then, you know, being a criminalist for such a long time now, I said, okay, let's flush that out of the system. Let's take a sample and, um, of, I mean, you, you imagine what happened. This was, again, um, human skin. So that's the story that I'm just going to, you know, put in front of you. I still don't know what to make out of it. I, my, my brain and my heart are really not arrived at whatever I want to make out of this for myself and for our laboratory and also what we should do with the stains um, because usually we bury the stains. That's what I usually do, but it makes no sense to bury those stains on the Buchenwald concentration camp site out of many reasons, um, not only because there's nothing on the site where you can bury them properly, but also because that was a, a site of suffering and pain. So that's not a good uh, grave site. And now we are thinking thinking about what to do about that. If you're interested in um, more of that, um, the, the little booklet that I did about um, Hitler's head and skull, I gave some samples out to some people. I still have some samples. If you scan the QR code, you get, it for, you get the PDF for free. You can download it. I did it on the occasion of this AFS meeting. And also we did a little movie because I see some forensic entomologists in the room. Um, you can scan this code and then you will get a free movie about uh, decomposition of um, a pig. Uh, very beautifully done so that it's not as disgusting as some people may think it is. Thank you very much.